Okay, this is part three of the video series called, Is It All the Same Disease? In part one, we showed how the mechanism of atherosclerosis causes disease all over the body. It plugs up the arteries to the brain, to the heart, to the legs, lower extremities, peripheral arterial disease. To the heart, you know, they're called the coronary arteries, so that's CAD, coronary artery disease. Uh, to the brain, cerebrovascular disease, all right? And then the other point is it's all the same thing. It's, they, it makes them obese, the high-fat diets. And then the high-fat diets stick the red blood cells together, so the blood's thicker, and that causes hypertension, higher pressure. The hypertension damages the arterial walls and thus causes atherosclerosis. The high fat causes insulin resistance, causes diabetes. The diabetes itself injures arterial walls and contributes to atherosclerosis formation. So they all start merging together to damage arteries, start plugging up arteries. When you plug up arteries to things, they stop working to the heart, the brain, to the legs. Okay, and then the next uh, video emphasizes spine. And what I showed was plugging up arteries do the same thing. So obesity, hypertension, uh, atherosclerosis, diabetes, damages the spine. It's the main cause of spinal degeneration, main cause of back pain, degenerative disc disease from ischemia. Ischemia is lack of blood flow, okay, causing lack of oxygen, hypoxia. All right, so what I'm showing is it's the same mechanism, messing up the spine as messes up the heart, the brain, the legs, okay? And now this video, we're going to add some more information to these, this uh, common mechanism concept here. So here is uh, how conventional medicine views the world. Disease number one, let's say gastroesophageal reflux disease. Leaky gut, these are some abdominal problems. Irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, varicose veins. It'll see these as all separate diseases. Autoimmune disease, cancer, <clears throat> memory problems, arthritis, low back pain, okay. And in conventional medicine, what it says is, you take the disease and you match the ill to the pill and then you send a bill. That's conventional thinking. And that's what all medical students are taught, every single medical school. Medical school is basically learning internal medicine, the diseases of adults. How do you manage those with pills? Okay. And I call this man's way, giving a different drug for everything. In the center, I call it God's way. I say God's way would be eat the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet with no oils, avoid toxins, get your exercise, your sleep, your sunshine, your stress management, have a purpose, have religion, exercise, and be social. You do that. That makes people healthy, okay? So now we're going to go a little further here. Okay, here's mass yield to the pill, send a bill. Again, it's pretty routine to see patients on 15 different medications, okay? But the problem is they take these pills every day. The patient is never cured. The old saying is if you cure a patient, you lose a customer. You don't want to do that. The dentistry equivalent uh, would be uh, drill them, fill them, and uh, bill them, okay? Basically, if you want to help people get better from common chronic diseases, the only thing that really works is low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet with no oil, okay? Preferably only organic, so you avoid the gly, you know what, phosate, um, and uh, filter your water so you avoid the F, you know what, or I'd, okay? Um, and so here basically is, you know, Gulliver is like a low-fat, vegan, nutrition, knowledgeable person, all right? And all these little patients are like conventional doctors, nurse practitioners, uh, because if you don't know the diet, then you don't know Jack. You don't know what matters, all right? There are a bunch of Lilliputians in comparison to somebody who knows nutrition and toxicology. And I joke, it's like this painting, the blind leading the blind from the Bible, the quote, you know, Pietro Bruegel, 1568. This is what you got with all these doctors, and that's why you have so many fat and sick doctors, because they don't know what they're talking about, and they're fat and sick themselves. People who eat low-fat vegan diet, they're skinny. Okay, you know, I'm 60 years old. I weigh the same as I did when I was senior in high school. College, I was a little bigger because I had more muscle, but I'm like senior in high school. Okay, here is the concept of the bliss point. So for the bliss point, what's going on is the food companies, they're smart. You know, they have a lot of money, billions of dollars. They do research, and they titrate the amount of salt, the amount of MSG, amount of monosodium glutamate, the amount of MFG, uh, manufactured free glutamate, high fructose corn syrup fat, to get it just right. They call it the bliss point of taste and the right mouth and feel and texture on the food. Or they'll fry it with the fat right here. So, you know, that's why you'll see things like Jay's potato chips that I bet you can't eat just one because they know it tastes good. They've tested that and optimized it with their audience. But the problem is when they make something taste so good, they call this being hyper palatable. Um, 
people overeat. You know, you eat more, you just put salt on your food, you're going to eat more. You put all this stuff on there, but people overeat a lot. And all the fat, the higher the percentage of calories from fat, the fatter the population gets. If you want to fatten up animals, you, um, you know, you add MSG to the food and they eat more of it too because it basically activates the protein receptors in the mouth and the upper digestive tract, the umami receptors, you know, telling the animal to have reward neurotransmitter released in the brain because they just found a high protein source. Our ancestors worried about starvation. So finding a high protein source was valuable to them because they were at risk to starve to death. But the modern people aren't having starvation diseases. I, I've never seen a starvation disease in my 30 years as a doctor. All I see is overeating diseases, okay? You know, the only starvation diseases, I know people who have anorexia nervosa, voluntary starvation. In Western countries, even the poor people are fat. Okay, this is just the concept of MFG, manufactured free glutamate. So what's being done here, I'm going to come off the screen for a moment, is you start out with a protein, and there's some Gs in there standing for glutamates. Glutamate's an excitatory neurotransmitter. It activates uh, brain cells, brain neurons. And you just break it apart by processing. Ultra-pasteurization breaks apart the proteins. You can add enzymes to it to lyse it, extract it, hydrolysis, fat separate it, ferment it. Any of these things will break up the individual glutamate so they become free. They're no longer bound to other amino acids. A protein is normally like a, a string of beads on a necklace. And each, each bead is an amino acid, the individual smallest component of a protein. And so once you separate the individual amino acids out, now you've got a lot of free glutamate floating around. And that makes the food taste very, very good, but it's not good for our health. It can lead to what's called excitotoxicity, overstimulation of the brain, and some other problems. And it gets people to overeat. Now here, real quick, is the structure of cholesterol. And cholesterol is, you know, a normal part of the human body, and it has, in its correct amounts, it's useful. I mean, it's used to adjust the stability of plasma membranes. It's used to synthesize the steroid hormones. You can see here's an estrogen, estradiol, di as in two, all as an alcohol group. So there's two alcohol groups. OH is an alcohol group. There's one right here, and there's one on the opposite end of the molecule. Okay, and you can see it has a cholesterol backbone. The internal ring structure is essentially like cholesterol. The one thing unique about it is you have an aromatic ring, meaning three double bonds here in the A ring. So here there's three double, there's the A ring, but no double bonds in cholesterol. But there's three double bonds here that's called an aromatic ring because the aroma, it smells uh, characteristic. Okay, the hydroxyl group, OH, also called an alcohol group, is antimicrobial, okay? This aromatic ring gives pretty good shelf life. So this makes a great preservative. Good shelf life, and it's uh, antimicrobial. So they'll put this in personal care products so they don't grow bacteria or mold in them, okay? So this is in all the personal care products, usually some form of estrogen. Um, estrogen also is a fat storage hormone. It causes the animal to gain weight with the idea that estrogen levels go up when an animal is pregnant, and they tell it to store weight because the baby might need that for energy. So they make people fat. They also cause, uh, in general, proliferation of breast ductal tissue, increasing the risk of breast cancer. Okay, now here is how the um, liver handles excess estrogen in the human body. Normally what it does is the liver will detoxify. If you have excess estrogen in your body, the liver will add something to it called the glucuronic acid. And the glucuronic acid makes it more soluble and bile. And it's basically a tag that's stuck to the estrogen, and it's a signal to the intestinal tract, in a sense, to leave it alone, and it gets defecated out in the stool. And that's how a normal, healthy person lowers their blood estrogen levels. However, we're supposed to have uh, good gut bacteria from eating a high-fiber diet. But if you don't eat enough dietary fiber, you get the bad bacteria from eating a diet of processed food and meat. The bad bacteria have more of a special enzyme called glucuronidase. So glucuronidase will cut this bond between the estrogen and the glucuronic acid. They'll cleave it, and then the estrogen gets reabsorbed into the blood, so the estrogen levels go up. So this is why a person who doesn't eat enough fiber is predisposed to leaky gut because of lack of fiber. They're predisposed also to high blood estrogen levels because the glucuronidase enzyme cleaving the conjugation of the glucuronic acid leading to the estrogen being free in the gut and that free estrogen being reabsorbed in the blood instead of being defecated out of their body. Because I'll, I'll tell you, I know patients, you know, from urban backgrounds, and, you know, the, they, they don't filter their water. They eat a lot of meat, a lot of processed food. They have very high rates of um, fibroids of the uterus, which are caused by high estrogen levels, and they often go for hysterectomies. Then the hysterectomy prevents them from menstruating, of course, and that leads to higher hematocrits and higher amounts of red blood cells in the blood, and they get more hypertension, and they get atherosclerosis at a younger age. 
and they often get quite sick from that. Okay, so I just went through a little bit about the estrogenic chemicals and their effect. Uh, now I'm gonna, and I went through the MSG and that stuff now, which affects the brain in a bad way. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about constipation. Dietary fiber adds water to the stool and it makes the stool liquefied. So when you defecate, you're normally a healthy person is popping out uh, a, a bowel movement looks like a cow patty, or at least it's very soft because it's, it's hydrated. It's got a lot of water in it from the fiber. If you don't have the dietary fiber, your stool gets dried out. And when you defecate, you're going to be popping out goat pellets or really hard little logs like Tootsie Rolls, and that's not good. It's going to cause, normally what happens is a soft stool is bulky and it stretches the rectum. And then like a, refl a reflex, the rectum, when it's stretched, will contract and you defecate, it's almost effortless. Versus when the stool's dried out, because it doesn't push on the wall, it doesn't cause initiation of that reflex contraction. Thus, the person strains, they tighten up their abdominal muscles, that's called a valsalva maneuver, to, to push out the goat pellets. And when they do that, the back pressure is transferred to the sigmoid colon here, and that causes diverticulosis, outpouching. The diverticulosis can pop, and then stool leaks into the abdomen, that's called diverticulitis. Okay, it can be very painful. At least one patient gets admitted to all the major Western hospitals every week for diverticulitis. I drain hundreds of abscesses related to diverticulitis. Okay, a pentacle lith means that the stool is dry on the right side of the colon and it can form a rock, a stool ball called a fecal lith that can obstruct the appendix. And then the mucous glands in the distal appendix continue to secrete and that'll cause the appendix to pop. That's appendicitis. The straining at the stool with the valsalva maneuver, tighten up one's abdominal muscle, will also cause pressure downward to be transmitted into the leg, into the leg veins, and that's going to cause varicose veins. So that's a cause of varicose veins. A similar effect, the pressure is transmitted down into the scrotum, and that'll cause uh, dilated veins in the scrotum, varicoceles. Those varicoceles can heat up the testicles and decrease sperm production and cause infertility. Uh, the high-fat diets also cause increased gallstones because the stones will precipitate from the excess, they'll be super saturated with cholesterol um, and you'll precipitate the stones. Over 90% of gallstones are, are cholesterol stones. The strain at the, at the defecation due to with valsalva maneuver pushes the stomach into the chest. That's called a hiatal hernia because the hole in the diaphragm is called a hiatus. So you get a hiatal hernia, the stomach bulging up into the chest and then the gastric acid secreted into that region will cause irritation of the adjacent esophagus and the GE junction, gastroesophageal junction area, increasing inflammation in that area called the Barrett's esophagus, which is a predisposition to increased risk of esophageal cancer. Many years ago, when I was a young guy in all the books, they talked about smoker-drinker cancer, squamous cell being the characteristic cancer type, whereas nowadays, most common cause of esophageal cancer, gastroesophageal cancer, is an adenocarcinoma related to this hiatal hernia reflux, okay? You'll also get more back pressure transmitted down to the veins of the rectum. You get more rectal hemorrhoids. That'll lead to blood on the toilet paper. Um, you get more back pressure down along the inguinal ligament. You get more inguinal hernias. So this whole constellation of symptoms and diseases is called abdominal pressure syndrome, and it was initially best described by Dennis Burkett. So he's famous as having been the founder of uh, abdominal pressure syndrome. Okay. And so what did I just say? It's the same thing. A, high, a diet high in fat, low in fiber, is what causes all this problem, okay? It's bad. And it's all part of that same constellation. That's why these patients, they all have the same diseases. You go up to any internal medicine doctor, a doctor who takes care of adult patients in America, and you tell them, are these common diseases? Diverticulosis, hiatal hernia, gastroesophageal reflux, they'll say, yeah, I see this stuff all day long, every day. Because it's all related. I'm gonna get into a little bit of more, less common esoteric stuff, but it's still related. Okay, here's glycine, it's the smallest amino acid. An amino acid is basically like a cross, okay? The head is the R group, okay? Then on one hand, this would be the, the acid, and the other one would be the amino. So here's the amino group, here's the, here's the amino group, here's the acid group, carboxylic acid. Uh, here's the top, the head is like a hydrogen, and then there's the R group, is the variable, okay? So the smallest R group, smallest, smallest variable group is glycine, it just has a hydrogen there. And that small size is what makes it work so well to be in spots where you need extra space, like in the enzyme pocket, to allow the substrate to come into the enzyme pocket for chemical reactions. Also, if you have to wrap something tight into a triple helix, like collagen, which is one-third of the proteins in the human body, most common protein in the human body, 
they like to have a glycine every third amino acid residue because it can be wrapped real tight into a triple helix. Well, guess what? Glyphosate will substitute itself for the glycines and it'll mess up your collagen, messing up the ligaments, which is damaging to the spine. It also was initially patented like as an antibiotic and it damages gut bacteria and it predisposes to leaky gut. Thus, it increases your risk of autoimmune disease. And it also predisposes the uh, body to fatty liver, which means it increases your risk of diabetes. Di fatty liver is like diabetes of the liver. Okay, so it's doing a lot of damage. And guess what? It activates the NMDA receptor in the brain, the excitatory receptor like glutamate does, so it's an excitotoxin too. Okay, isn't that wonderful? That's what's on your processed food. That's what's on most of your soy. All these geniuses telling you, oh, soy is good for you. Yeah, right. It's typically sprayed with this, amongst all the other problems it has. Okay. Watch out. Whenever somebody recommends soy, you should not trust them anymore because it either means they're an ignoramus or they're a liar. Okay. Um, collagen, I talked about substituting this with glyphosate GP at every third residue, and then your collagen's not going to work as well. Stephanie Seneff has written a lot about this. If your collagen ligaments are functioning well, you're going to predispose to problems with your spine. Okay, and then F minus, you know, floor, hide, as in what's in the most tap water in Western countries, is also damaging to your spine. It can substitute out for the hydrogens in the collagen and, and weaken the collagen, and you'll get um, anterior bridging osteophytes on your vertebra, very much like what one gets with DISH. They're very similar, and I think they're synergistic, and so a lot of Westerners are eating all three. They're eating the GP on their uh, GMO soy, they're eating the F minus in their unfiltered tap water, and then they're eating the high-fat diets causing atherosclerotic ischemic, ischemia related dish. So their spines are screwed. I see terrible looking spines every day. Um, you can also get problems from the F minus. You get uh, dental fluorosis and some other problems. But uh, here's a messed up spine where you can have a herniated disc here. This is more of a T2 sequence than a, than a gradient. So I, it's hard to, to differentiate that. You can see there's a big uh, disc here. So I don't know how much of that is disc extrusion versus OPLL ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. I'd have to look at the gradient sequence to be more certain of that. But the bottom line is all this stuff messes up your spine, and it's not good for your health. Um, the leaky gut, because of the lack of dietary fiber, then predisposes to what's called uh, protein traversal of the leaky gut, big chunks of protein. They mimic the amino acid sequences of proteins in our own human body because they're coming from animal foods. You form antibodies to them, and those antibodies cross-react with um, tissue in our own body, like brain tissue, demyelination, taking, destroying the myelin of the neurons near the ventricular system. So this is called antibody cross-reactivity between casein, the milk protein, and myelin-associated glycoprotein results in central nervous system demyelination. Yeah, like multiple sclerosis. So this is what I'm trying to tell you is dairy is really bad. Dairy is the number one association with type 1 diabetes, damaging the beta cells of the pancreas. But guess what? Dairy is also associated with multiple sclerosis, a terrible autoimmune disease. Okay? So, and, and the milk drinking areas in Norway, for example, had much more MS, according to the research of Roy Swank, versus not so much in the coastal areas where they didn't uh, drink so much milk. Okay? And it wasn't a question of longitude and latitude, because they had similar longitude and latitude, the coastal versus the central areas. So you can't just attribute it to the amount of sunshine or the amount of vitamin D, okay? It was the diet. All right, and that's it for this part three of is it all the same disease? And I basically showed you, you know, all these abdomen diseases are manifestations and side effects of eating, you know, an improper diet, the typical westernized diet, high in fat, low in fiber. And uh, those are the problems it causes. So I'm getting at is, this is actually good in a sense. You're seeing how all these diseases are caused by things that are all kind of the same thing. A high fat, high sodium, uh, hyper palatable diet because of the MSG, MSG and all that stuff and fried food and a lack of fiber.